All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to uh, our eLearning and Covered's free webinar Friday. Today we are talking about uh, tips for creating great sounding audio in Audacity. Now, um, I know some of you have been answering some of the questions on the screen about what your role is, but I would love to know a little bit more about, about you specifically. Uh, because this topic, although I'm talking about it in an e-learning sense, um, I think this is a topic that uh, applies to many different people in many different industries. So, curious to know, when it comes to recording audio, are you using it? Let me know in chat, are you using audio for e-learning? Are you a professional narrator? Do you do your own audio narration? I'm curious to know the background, your background a little bit. Okay, Daniel, e-learning, do your own narration. Very good. Steve does audiobook narration. Very cool. Okay. Janet does e-learning, but she does some music stuff as well, which is awesome. Graham is a voiceover actor. Okay, well, very good. So it looks like we have a good mix of people. Now, let me let me say this right off the bat. I am not by any means an audio engineer. Um, I, my background personally is I'm an e-learning designer, and I've recorded and edited audio for the purposes of e-learning courses. Um, you know, we all work in environments where, or we have worked in environments where we can't afford professional audio narration, so we have to do it ourselves, right? Um, and even when we go out and you get professional audio, sometimes you need to do some editing if the narrator didn't do uh, any post-production. And the tool that I like to use is Audacity, and that's really what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm going to be sharing some tips about how I make really great sounding audio in Audacity. Now, Audacity is a great program. I'll talk a little bit about that, but I do want to mention by, by any means, I am not <laughs> an audio engineer. I'm sharing tips that I've learned over the years. Um, for making audio sound good, and I, I feel like I've become much better at it than I was uh, earlier on. So let me share my screen here, because I have some some tips I want to share at the beginning um, about recording audio in general. Um, and let me get this up here real quick. Give me one moment. Um, you know, when you record audio, whether it's for e-learning or anything else, um, it's more than just what you do from an editing perspective to make that audio sound great. Uh, regardless of the program you're using or the equipment you're using or whatever it is you're recording, um, if you've ever heard of the phrase um, uh, garbage in, garbage out, that applies r quite heavily when it comes to any sort of audio production or even video production for that matter. Um, you know, when you record audio, if it records, if you create garbage audio from the beginning, there's not much you can do to make the audio sound good. So there's a lot of things to do before you even get to the stage of editing your audio to ensure that you're editing audio that is already of a high quality um, because you can't just throw garbage into Audacity and make it sound beautiful. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and when it comes to making really great professional sounding audio without a professional budget, um, which most of us are having to work with, um, it really comes down to three things. Your equipment, the equipment that you use to record that audio, the environment that you record it in, because that can affect the quality. And of course, what you do after the fact with editing, which I'll show you some things I do specifically in Audacity. So the first thing is you really need to be starting with the right equipment. Um, I always get questions all the time about what microphones do people use? Uh, what programs do they, do they use to edit it in? Do, they, do we use a sound booth, et cetera, et cetera? And over the years, the equipment that's available to us from a consumer standpoint has gone down significantly in pricing. I mean, several years ago, you know, before there were the Amazons and the Ebays of the world, buying a really good quality microphone was not cheap. And buying, um, you know, acoustic foam or creating a sound booth was not a cheap or easy thing. And that's changed over the years. There's a lot of excellent tools and resources out there to help you. So I wanted to show you some of the things from an equipment standpoint that I like to point out. Um, first off with a microphone. Um, having a really good quality microphone is one thing that I always suggest doing, especially if you're going to be recording your own audio uh, or you're recording the audio of a subject matter expert or whatever it is, you really want to start with a good microphone. And oftentimes people will result or, or, or they, people will end up using 
their built-in microphone in their computer, and I'm I'm just not a big fan of that for a couple of reasons. And you know, when you record audio and you use your microphone, even with a really great computer, I have a MacBook. I love my MacBook, um, and it has a great camera on it, and I'm sure it has a really great microphone. However, the built-in microphone on my MacBook, you may not realize it, um, but computers make sound. <laughs> and if you record with a microphone that's connected to that, that device, your computer, it's going to pick up all those sounds, right? Um, and uh, so I always say choose a really good external mic. Now, we all remember those really, 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 really poorly built cheap mics that you would buy at like Walmart that um, looked like a long pencil and had a little stand. Um, those are, I wouldn't even consider those good mics. So one that I like to use, and this is the one, I'm actually using it for my audio on this webinar, I use it for all audio purposes, is a blue microphone such as this one. Um, they've come down in price. I mean, right now Amazon has them for 49 I think when I purchased it was for 80 Connor, you said you've got a blue mic, but it's not that one. Um, and Daniel, you got one for $80. It seems like most people have this one. It's a really fantastic mic. It plugs into the USB drive, and it works with most computers. I've never had to install anything for the computer to detect it. Um, now, Steve, you've heard that um, USB mics aren't always the best for voice actors. You know, I haven't heard a lot about that. Um, I'm not sure about the quality with, with USB mics, um, and I'm not sure, uh, you know, besides plugging into the microphone port, which I don't even think my computer has, it has the headphones, I'm not sure what else I would plug it into. Uh, does anyone else use anything other than um, a USB mic? I'm curious to know. And Steve, if you use something different, I'd love to know that as well. Yeah, so that's all Greek to me. <laughs> um, but I think you mentioned you do some professional audio. So does that record into your computer, and how does it connect? Yeah, Steve has a nice mic, it sounds like. Got it. It goes through a mixer before. That makes sense. Sure. And I would say, um, and you know, we all have different backgrounds. I would say what Steve has set up is probably above average from what most people would um, choose to use from a technical standpoint. I've loved my Blue Yeti, but but if you're doing really, really serious audio work and you can afford more, better equipment, by all means. Fantastic. Now, um, there's several other mics that are on the market that work really well. I mean, I'll scroll down here. I don't know if it's going to show them. Um, you know, and, and the Blue Company, they have several other mics, but I think this is a good solid mic, especially if you're just starting. Some of the other equipment that I will mention um, that uh, is really nice to have, especially if you're recording audio, is a pop filter. Um, a pop filter helps to block your breath from actually hitting into the microphone. Um, now, Blue, yeah, the Blue microphones, they claim that it kind of has the built-in pop filter, but it really doesn't. Um, and a pop filter, all it is, is just a, it's pretty much like a mesh screen um, that goes in front of your computer to help, you know, reduce the amount of breath that hits the, the microphone. It helps eliminate, you know, if I were to say Peter Piper picked a pepper, it would help all that, uh, it would help filter that out. There are obviously tricks you can do in Audacity, which I'll show in a little bit, to help get that out because the pop filter is not going to protect it from everything. Another thing that I just saw in here, also one of these, um, and this fits with a blue microphone. You've probably seen these before. Um, this helps suspend the microphone, um, and it helps uh, reduce any vibrations that the microphone might pick up. Um, but I've never really had that issue personally when it comes to recording, my, you know, recording audio. Another thing that um, I've started using that's been really nice for me is a portable audio booth, um, which is really fantastic if you have to, you know, go around and record audio with subject matter experts. Um, and I've used this, I've actually purchased and used this audio booth before in a previous job, and it worked really good. It folds up very nicely, um, and it has really good acoustic foam. Um, but it is $189. It's a little bit more expensive. Um, for me personally, now that I work from home, I've resulted to making my own audio booth. I took an old, like, Rubbermaid tub, and I went to my guitar shop locally here and bought some audio foam and, and lined it, and it's worked, um, I would say, just as well. 
Um, and there's several different variations of this as well that you can use. I see Steve, you're typing, so I'll, I'll give you a moment. And Connor as well. So an audio booth, uh, Connor, what an audio booth does is the audio foam um, it essentially helps prevent echoing. So if you're in a large conference room or any room and you're recording, um, your microphone will pick up an echo when it, you know, the sound waves bounce off the room. And the audio foam is designed to prevent that. It, it, it absorbs your voice so it doesn't bounce off to a wall and, and um, hit items. Steve says an egg crate foam works for this too. Don't necessarily have to use professional audio foam. Yep, I completely agree. I'll tell you. Um, let me bring up this image here. Now, if you don't want to spend the money here and if you don't want to, you know, even audio foam, I'll tell you, I spent probably, when I built my own little audio booth, I ended up spending about $60 and most of that cost went towards the audio foam, the acoustic foam. Um, and if you can't do that, I mean, this is, and this is from a previous life when I, when I worked for an organization that had no budget whatsoever. Um, I'll show you the way that we rigged a fake audio booth. It's kind of funny. Um, we used two computer cases and we <laughs> encased the uh, microphone around it and it actually surprisingly worked really well. It helped prevent the, uh, you know, some echoes from coming in and hitting the microphone. So, I mean, that's kind of a backwards way of doing it, but if you really are on a low budget and you don't have any money and you need something really quick, um, I've done this before and it's, it's actually worked quite well when it came to preventing the echo from hitting your voice or hitting the microphone. I see Steve, you're typing again. Go right ahead. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> we've done that before, and it's always it's always makes for a good laugh. Um, and Steve says he's actually heard that recording in your car can work sometimes because it's soundproof. I've never heard of that, and you know that's actually a really good idea. Because uh, when you think about when you're in a car, you don't hear a lot of echo when you talk. It actually, now that I think about it, when you talk in a car, it kind of dampens that that echo. So that's another option as well. Yeah, you know, if if you're if you're recording audio with high level individuals, this might look a little a little cheap. But you know, if you go to your CEO's office and you record with this uh, setup, you know, it's a good way to go. Yeah, we need more resources, and maybe they'll be able to make that happen for you. Another. Um, a tool that I've used, that I'm not a big fan of, it's helped a little bit, is you can get these audio shields and it connects to a, a stand here and it simply uh, helps, uh, you know, it's kind of like audio booth, the inside of it, let me find it here, the inside of it is lined with some audio foam. I'm not a huge fan of this, it, it really, I didn't notice much difference in the quality of my audio when I recorded it using a tool like this. Um, but with that combined with an audio booth and the pop filter, you know, it could help. Um, I will say I did buy this particular model. Um, and I will tell you that uh, I bought it and I spent, the, I think I spent $50 on it. And this thing down here um, where it connects snapped off after like two days. So you can, you know, be cautious with things like this. It hasn't done a whole lot to help me. Um, any other audio equipment, I guess equipment besides the microphone and, and recording booth, anyone else use uh, for recording audio for those of you who have more experience? I'm curious to know. Yep, that's another thing I've seen people do is you can hang blankets that'll help dampen um, the sound as well so that you don't get a lot of echo. Christina and Graham, I see you're both typing. Oh, I love that idea, Graham, having a little clicker to mark where errors are in the audio. That's fantastic. One of the things I've done, this is I've done this when I've been recording, when I'm recording video with audio, is if I get a really good shot, if I'm happy with the shot that I got, I'll either you know clap right in front of the camera or just cover my hand with the camera so I have that dark spot to indicate that. That was a good good take. Yeah, and Daniel, I've heard of that. You know, if you take some uh, tights or pantyhose, you can make your own pop filter because that's really all it is. All right, so that brings me to my second point. Let me find it here. So we started with the right equipment. Um, next thing is recording in the proper environment. 
you can do a lot with, with equipment to help your audio, but if you're recording in a bad environment to begin with, that can make it much harder. Um, you'll have to use more equipment. Now, the things that I'm going to say I think apply to individuals who are working in office environments and they have to record within their office. Um, and you may not have access to a, a specified room that you can hang blankets on. You might have to go into a conference room or even at your cubicle um, to record audio. Some of the things that over the years I've learned you, you want to be aware of is, um, you know, whenever I'm looking at a room to potentially record in, Sometimes it's the littlest thing that may not sound very loud to you, but can easily be picked up by your microphone. Um, beware of the following, airflow vents and fans. If you work in an office or you're recording in a room that has a vent that turns on periodically, a heater or uh, an air conditioner, you want to be aware of that because that can obviously create inconsistencies in your audio. Neighbors and children, that's a big one. I, I work from home and I record from home and uh, there are times when I'm trying to record something and I just I have to wait until the children stop screaming at the top of their lungs to be able to get my recording. Um, and of course, neighbors and cars. Uh, Janet says, ringer on the phone. Uh, Steve says he has to shut off the AC. Yeah, I agree. I have a studio in my basement where I'll do video and audio. And, and in this past winter, I had to turn off the furnace <laughs> for the 30 minutes or however long I was recording. And in Wisconsin, you can imagine how cold that got. But it helped my audio be really well. I sound really well. Uh, adjacent meeting rooms, offices, you know, conversations happening in another room may not sound very loud, but I guarantee you it can easily get picked up uh, in your audio. Outside cars, air traffic, that's another one. I, you know, I used to work at the Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin uh, in one of their state buildings, and we were right next to um, an Air Force base, and every day at the same hour, uh, they would have, they would fly the jets, and those would be very loud. Um, computer equipment. Um, again, this comes back to the little things that don't seem very loud but can affect your audio. The fan in your computer, any vibrating, even anything that can come off your computer can, can cause sounds. Even fluorescent lights, I, I've had, you know, you don't, it doesn't sound very loud, but if you get a little bit of buzzing of a fluorescent light, that can affect your audio. So when I look for an environment, I guess I didn't talk about that. Oh, well, yeah, let's talk about maintaining a consistent environment, because that's another thing. When you're recording, once you pick an environment, and you're recording, let's say, for an e-learning course, and you have 15 slides, and you may not be recording all of them at the same time, you want to make sure your environment is a, as consistent as possible. Um, again, there's only so much you can fix from a consistency standpoint in editing uh, when you're going into editing. So you want to make it as consistent as possible. So maintain a consistent distance from the microphone. Um, you'll see, I don't have a picture of it, but you'll see people, you know, they will point out their pinky and their thumb and make something that's like six or seven inches away from the microphone. So you want to maintain consistency in terms of the distance you are from your microphone. You want to use the same microphone and recording settings for the duration of your recording session. So if you're recording something with a microphone, make sure you always use that microphone and, and any settings you have when you record. Um, I always try to att attempt to complete the entire recording session in a single session. So whether that's in a complete single recording or if I'm recording for a single slide, I will do my best to record the entire slide in one take, just so it's consistent. Obviously, those might be unrealistic expectations for some people, um, but I try to record it all, all in one session while my voice is consistent. You know, If I record something one day in the afternoon and then I record the next half in the morning, your voice will be surprisingly different compared to um, how warmed up your voice is during that time. And I see, Jason, you're typing and Steve as well. And if possible, I would even suggest warming up your voice. There's a lot of warm-up activities you can you can do. I, I have a theater background, and we always warmed up our voice by um, doing all sorts of activities, and there's several of them online. Um, Jason says, is it preferred to be sitting or standing? Does it make a difference? I think it does make a difference. Um, for me, um, standing, I when I'm standing, I have a stronger voice. When you're sitting and you're slouching, I, I notice I have a stronger, I have a harder time using my full diaphragm uh, to get m the words out and projecting. So right now I'm sitting, I don't know if you could tell or not, um, but I, I find that if I'm standing it sounds much better. Steve says the real issue for audiobooks is where the recording can take tens of hours. Yeah, that's true. If you're recording tons of audio, that can, that can be hard because you're going to have a much harder time maintaining consistency there. Um, so... Let's see what else I have here. Make sure your energy doesn't wane as you complete a long recording session. So sometimes you just have to stop and go, okay, I, I'm done because 
it's taking too much energy. Your voice will start cracking. I, you know, when I train, I, I train how to use programs like Storyline. And I'll tell you, after talking for even just three or four hours, your voice, you know, I've, I've walked away, finished a training feeling like I'm getting sick, and it really is just my, my throat is sore from talking. Um, <laughs> and Connor says, you must have a voice like Morgan Freeman uh, if you're going to be recording audiobooks. That's funny. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, well, and I guess one thing, one thing I wanted to mention on my list, I, I didn't get a chance to talk about when, re, when recording environment. I talked about all sorts of things you should watch out for. Here are some things I think you should be looking for when choosing a recording environment. Um, if you have to record in an office area, um, you know, if you're choosing a conference room, I always try to choose one that's a little bit isolated from the rest of the, the office where there's not going to be a lot of people walking by or laughing or talking or whatever that is. And I also try to choose small rooms. The larger the room and the emptier that room is, the more echo you're going to have um, uh, potentially affecting your recording. So, all right. So finally, enhancing your audio. Enhancing your audio call comes down to uh, the tools you use to edit your audio. Um, now, again, for those of you who work in an office environment where your budgets are low and you don't have a lot of money to buy a professional audio re editing and recording program, the program that I'm really talking about today is Audacity. And I use Audacity for all of my audio recording needs. I use it for my editing needs. And it's a fantastic program. And if you've never used Audacity, um, Audacity is 100% free. You can download it for free. And um, I think it's a fantastic program, especially for, for people who are just starting to get into audio recording and editing. Um, has anyone, so Connor, you've never used Audacity. Who else has never used or downloaded Audacity before? I'm curious to know. Graham uses it for everything. That's fantastic. Haven't used it in a long time, okay. Gotta love the price tag, right, Jason? Yeah, it's free. It's a fantastic program. And it's also available on both Mac and Windows. So today I'm using my Mac. Um, I was just looking at it, comparing it between Windows and Mac, and I don't I didn't notice any differences from a user interface standpoint. So if you happen to be using Windows, I'm almost 100% certain that the, from an interface standpoint and the setting standpoint, they're pretty identical. There might be a little bit of inconsistencies, but anything I show you today on the Mac side, um, from the things I'm showing, it operates the same way on the Windows side. And Steve mentioned, I agree with this, Audacity, has, you can download a lot of different plugins for different features that if you don't have, you know, for example, if you want to publish out to MP3 versus WAV, you have to download a plugin to do that. So let's, let me open up Audacity. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a couple things about using the program. So um, whenever I'm... Um, Whenever I'm working with audio in Audacity, obviously everything I've talked about with selecting the mic and uh, recording your environment, when it comes to coming into Audacity, it, recording is, is, there's some additional settings you can use to make the recording better. Now when you first, I'm not going to go into every, diddle, every bit of detail here with the recording environment um, and the settings, but when you first open up Audacity, the environment can seem a little bit intimidating. And a couple things I will say about it is that, um, you know, if you've used any other sort of uh, timeline-based editing tool, whether it's a video editor, an audio editor like Audacity or GarageBand, or even if you're just a Storyline user and you've used the Timeline and Storyline um, or Camtasia, you know, Audacity is really the same thing. It's a timeline-based editing tool. And, uh, you know, here's the timeline area, and as I record, you'll see that there'll be a track here where my audio will be. You have the, you know, standard tools up here for play, pause, stop, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And then you have a bunch of tools here to help you zoom in and whatnot. Now, the first thing you'll notice, it's picking up my microphone. And you'll see that it's already going into the red. One of the things I always suggest doing when you first open up Audacity is selecting the microphone you want to record from and then also adjusting the, the levels of that microphone. Right now, you'll see it's picking it up. And as it's picking up my audio and this, what's called the monitor here, it's going all the way over into the red. Um, and you can adjust, well, first off, let me show you how to select a microphone. You have the options here for microphone. Um, and right now it's picking in my built-in microphone on my computer. And that's why I think it sounds, it looks so bad. 
I can choose to do my my blue snowball microphone and again I, in my experience it's automatically detected those microphones now I have to click to start the monitoring and you can see the monitoring is in a much better level it's it's going into the yellow a little bit but my you know my voice levels are a little inconsistent you can always adjust the um, I guess if you will the sensitivity of your microphone or the levels by just adjusting it here and you can see it starts bringing it down a little bit so I'm not going into the yellow um, and obviously you want to you want to get it as loud as possible without peaking and peaking is when it gets into that yellow and red and you can see I'm starting to peak here and that's where you get the distortions and the really bad audio quality um, that you want to avoid you can fix those things after the fact but again if you can prevent it in the first place it's always that's always the best thing you can do so I always bring it down to the point where when I'm talking it's just barely starting to become yellow because you don't want it to peak too much that's really going to help with your levels uh, so you don't have to do so much editing after the fact now when you're ready to record and of course the peak streak there because my voice modulation went way up there but when you're ready to record all you have to do is hit record and, and it'll start creating a track now I have some sample narration I have to find it here in my uh, my notes here that I'm going to record and um, and usually when I record um, I'll hit record and you can see it's recording here and I like to leave and this will make sense here in a little bit I like to leave some silence at the beginning and end of my recording and you'll see why that is in a moment just so I can pick up the ambient sounds of the room so I'm gonna wait about you know I'll say five to ten seconds to pick up some silence and then I'll start my recording so I'm gonna be silent for a minute and then I'll start recording All right, so now let me start my script. I'm gonna go ahead and read my script. Whether you realize it or not, identity theft is a major concern, both here in the US and globally. In this course, we will review some of the strategies you can take to recognize potential identity theft, protect yourself from identity theft, and repair the damage caused by identity theft. All right, so now that I'm done doing my recording, I can just hit stop here, and I have a recording here. And I can go through it and I can see my recording this is called an audio waveform and uh, one of the things you want to watch out for and again adjusting that microphone volume before you even begin recording will really help with this but you can see you know it's showing me the different levels of um, um, that audio and when you record and you work with audio the the goal is to make this waveform as consistent and even as possible if you see any spikes in the audio where it's coming all the way to the top that's where it got too hot and it's spiking in that audio and that's where you're going to get those distortions and really bad modulations in volume and intensity um, for the most part I would say this is pretty even I mean there's some spikes here but you know I'm going to take you through some of the, the strategies I've used to um, help repair this audio so um, I see Connor you're typing I'll give you a moment Yeah, Connor, so spikes are where the volume peaked. I can show you that here. Let me um, let me go down here to the end. I'm going to do something here. Uh, I'm going to re record something with a lot of P's because that's going to be something else I'm going to show you in a moment. So I'm going to hit recording. You'll see it creates a second track here. And I'm going to say uh, Peter picked a Piter Pepper. I have no idea what that's supposed to be. Or I'll go P. Okay, and I'll stop it here. And you can see there are the, these spikes. And you can see the the uh, levels between the audio some of them are really high and some of them are low and it's just all around inconsistent one of the things I'll be showing you how to do in a little bit is remove something from the audio called plosives um, which are the, the uh, that gets caught into the microphone especially if you're not using a pop filter uh, those plosives show up in the audio and I can show you a way to remove those in audacity so let's talk about this audio here that I initially recorded let me go up here um, this is the track for the audio um, and it's recorded in stereo so there's there's a left and a right track so you can see both of those there that's not something I really worry too much about you know I just pretend like it's all one um, for the sake of uh, what I'm doing uh, for my audio and a uh, couple things about the interface that you know I can explain obviously you have a playhead this playhead is I can select items in the playhead and I can preview what's there by hitting play and I don't know how much of that you can hear through your your end 
Um, and of course I can hit stop or bring it all the way back to the beginning and hit play to preview the entire thing. Now the first thing I always do when I am editing my audio, um, the first thing I always like to do is I like to clean it up by removing any background noise. And this is probably one of the most common popular things people want to know how to do with their audio. And when I say background noise, I mean the stuff in the background, like the room, you know, the ambient noise, the hum that you might have in your room. And if there's any one thing I would say you can do to improve the quality of your audio, it's to remove background noise. Because that is just the stuff, the humming in the background, that you can strip out from your recording and make it sound much better. And removing background noise is a two-step process. Um, first thing I'll mention, though, that is why I recorded that, you know, this section of silence here. I always record that silence at the beginning or end of my recording just so that I can pick up the overall ambient noise. Um, that might be um, the humming of an of a AC or vent that you may not have discovered or the humming of your computer or anything like that. I always record that silence so that I can pick that up. And what I'm going to use in Audacity is I'm going to use that silence. Uh, Audacity is going to scan for that and, and identify it. And um, it'll what's called it'll profile it, if you will, and I can use that to to strip that out from my audio. So what I typically do to remove my background noise is I will find this section of audio where there's this background noise, and I'll select it. And you'll see there's all these different effects in Audacity. I'm not going through all of them. I only use a handful of them, but depending on what you're doing, you might use some or um, more of them. And you have this option for noise reduction. Now I don't know why in my head. Um, in, in the window side, it, I think it says remove background noise, or maybe it is noise reduction, I don't know. But it does the same thing, and you click on this, and the first thing you have to do is get the noise profile. And if I click on this, what it does is it sampled that, that noise audio, and it sampled it. And then the second thing you have to do is select your entire audio, and it will use that profile that it selected and strip it out. Oh, so it's noise removal in, in Windows. Okay, thank you so much. So then what I'll do is I'll select my entire audio file, and all I did was double click on it. I go back to effect and do noise reduction or noise removal in Windows, and then I'll just hit OK. And depending on how your audio, how well it recorded initially, you might notice the reduction. I'm using a really good microphone, I'm in a pretty good environment, so you may not have noticed an actual change. But let me, um, what I'd like to do here is I'm actually going to record another bit of audio and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to duplicate some background noise. So I'm going to start recording here, and I'm just going to make some background noise myself. Okay. To prevent identity theft, one of the first steps you want to take is recognize the potential signs of identity theft. Okay. So I don't know if you could hear the background noise, um, and I just totally rambled off some dialogue off the top of my head. Uh, but you'll notice there's these very tiny, ever so, you know, very slight spikes in the audio. Um, and I'll try to turn, let me turn up my volume and see if we can hear that. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it on your end. Let me turn my microphone towards the computer. Yeah, you're not going to be able to hear that, but there's an ever so slight hum in the background. And I can do the same thing here. I can select the audio, go to effect, noise reduction, get that profile, and then select my entire track by double clicking and effects, and then do noise reduction and just do it. And you'll see, I don't know if you notice the difference, but it's removed a lot of that. So if I were to hit play now, and again, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, I can tell you from my end, that hum that I was creating is nearly gone. I, I didn't even hear it in that few a little bit. Now you can see there's some additional stuff here that you can manually go in and silence. There's some silence here um, where it'll silence it out. You can, you can edit some of those out there manually. So if there's any one thing that you can do with your audio to, to improve the quality is remove the background noise. I would always suggest doing that. It's one of the most popular things. Um, for those of you who've used Audacity before, any other thoughts on removing background noise? Have you never done that before? I would say Steve, our, our local expert here, <laughs> probably has a lot to say. Yes, yeah, so the feature is great. Okay. Okay, so Steve usually does it at the end. 
Um, in my research, when I first started using Audacity, I see a lot of people who do it at the beginning. Some people do it at the end. Um, and those are things that you can experiment with to see what works for you as well. Yeah, I do it every time. Even if, it, even if I think it's okay, I agree with Danielle. I do it every time. Graham says the first thing to do, but the more time you allow to sample, the better. Um, yeah, I, I, I've experienced that as well. Um, using, you know, selecting more time is usually better as well. I see Steve's typing, so I'll give him a moment. We have a lot of people typing. Yeah, I would agree with you, Steve. You know, sometimes if you do the the silence, um, you'll hear that silence actually because it's true silence. You'll hear that in your audio, so you want to be careful with that. Steve says I also record the room tone separately and paste bits of it when editing out mistakes. Sometimes generated silence can be heard. Yeah. Oh, I love that idea. So that's another thing you can do is if you want to record just a track within itself of the room silence, you can use that not only to get your profile and use that in all of your tracks, but you can also, you know, like Steve mentioned, cut and paste some of that, especially if you want that that background hum <laughs> or whatever the ambient noise is to be to be silent. And Connor says, what about the new Apple software update already? Um, regarding specifically iOS 9? Do you use, do you use uh, your phone for recording? Or I think I'm missing the connection. Oh yeah, off topic. Uh, if we're going off topic, I'll say I updated iOS 9 and it's still being really buggy for me. That's all I'll say about that. <laughs> all right, so the next thing that I like to do, um, well, let me talk about this because this is something that um, I like to do when I'm just doing a little bit of edits to my audio. One of those things that people uh, like to remove from their audios, things that are called plosives, um, like explosives minus the EX, so plosives. And again, those are those sounds that end up in your audio. And uh, I recorded some earlier here. And let's see if it actually made its way into the audio. So I'm going to zoom into my track here a little bit. Let me play this. To prevent identity theft. Nope, that's not where I recorded it. Let's go over here. This might have been it. Recording. Let's see, it creates a second track here. And I'm going to say uh, Peter picked up. Pepper. Okay, so there it is. So I'm just going to zoom in here, zoom into this section here. And plosives are these little artifacts in your audio that dip down right here. Okay, and that's the little bit of sound that got picked up that wasn't really part of the word, um, and that's that p sound. And the way that I usually fix this is with the equalizer in Audacity. And the equalizer is one of those things that can be intimidating for some people. And I could spend a lot of time explaining all of the different features and options in the equalizer, but I'll try to break it down in a way that I think is simple for people to understand. Um, in your audio, you have bass tones and treble tones and everything in between. And a plosive usually falls into something that's more bass sounding, like the bass. And um, you can usually filter this out using your equalizer. So what you want to do is usually select this. And again, the plosive is usually identified by this little dip here before that p word. So here's that plosive right there. Let's see if I can find another one here. 
No, that one's a little that one's a little flat. Here's another one. I think that might be one. Not sure what the word was there. No plosives over here. So it's just it's just a little bit of dip. Um, and the way I fix this is I'll usually select it and go to my effects and go to my equalization or my equalizer. And it looks like this, and, and the best way I can think of describing an equalizer is I remember my mom, when I was a kid, she had a big boom box, and it had an equalizer on it, and I never under, you know, it's those things, you adjust those settings, you make little curves, you don't really know what that does, right? But I can, I can describe a little bit of it for you, just in basic terms. So when we look at the equalizer here, there's all these numbers, I won't define those for you, but I'll tell you, things towards the left are usually in the bass, those are the bass sounds, and things towards the right are the treble treble sounds or tones, if you will. And uh, usually the way that I, I edit these out is you want to select the audio and I usually reduce that bass and that'll usually flatten it out to get rid of that plosive. So I usually start at around, um, if I hover it over here, it'll come up. Let me click and hover. That's 160 hertz. Um, that's usually where the bass tone starts. And I'll usually just start dragging this down to create a simple curve. Um, and this is just reducing the amount of bass that is in that selected part of audio. And as you get down here, and sometimes you have to play with it a little bit, just create a nice little curve. I don't know how well of a curve that is, but let's see here. Let me fine tune it here. And it creates this curve where it's going to get rid of some of that bass that you see in that audio. Now, when I hit OK, it should flatten this out. And sometimes if your plosive is just really, really dramatic, that, that won't work. You can do other things. But that usually works for most of them. And if I hit OK, you see how it flattened that out? So now if I select this, I wish I would have showed it. I can undo it. Let me edit and undo. And let me select this and play it. Peter. Hard to hear over the webinar, but Peter. it removes those plosives ever so slightly. So you sometimes I will spend, I'll go through my audio and I'll find those. Now one of the great things you can do, um, let me go back to my equalizer, and I should have done this before I exited out of it. If you spend the time creating a really nice curve here for your equal, equalizer for removing, and I'll just quickly do it here. I know this is not going to be a pretty curve at all by any means. But what you can do is you can save it off. So you can save the curve and give it a name and name it for plosives or something along those lines. And... Um, and remember that to remove those in the future. And I'll just save it here. Where's my rename here? Yeah, you can save it off. Okay. So Jan, I see you're typing. What is the green versus the blue in the curve? Um, you know, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> that's one of those things that's really, really technical that I'm not really sure about. Um, does anyone else know that by chance? The green versus the blue line? Steve, yes, Connor, I agree. Does Steve, do you know that? Yeah, I agree. I think it might be an average because you can see it's a little bit of a cleaner line. So it might be just showing an average. I don't know if I can select it if I go to draw the curves. Yeah. It lets me draw the curve manually, but it doesn't. I can't select this green line here. Yeah, we'll have to Google it. I'll Google it after the fact. Okay, so that's one way you can remove plosives. Now, after I've done all that, let me look at my notes here. What I usually do is um, I usually amplify my audio. And again, some people, depending on your experiences, you might do this in different orders than what I do. Um, but the reason why I usually amplify my audio second is usually when you remove the background noise, sometimes it'll, it'll decrease the volume of that audio. Now, there's three things that I usually do. I do amplification, normalization, and compression. And let me try to define these for you. Amplification allows you to over globally, if you want, or in a selected piece of audio, overall amplify the, the sound of that. Now normalization and compression does things compared to the top level and all sorts of interesting things, which I'll explain in a moment. But usually I'll amplify my audio by affecting it and going to amplify. And you can increase how loud it is um, overall just to give it to boost it up a little bit. Um, and I usually do that, again, because when I when I remove my background noise, it, it decreases that audio a little bit. So I'll do that to overall amplify the overall track, um, just to make it a little bit louder here. So you can see how it made it a little bit taller there. 
Um, and it looks like Jason, I, I, I don't even know if you, you must have copied and pasted that. <laughs> so you guys can read that out if you'd want to. I'm, I'm just going to quickly scan it regarding those curves. Uh, blue curve joining together numbers with white curves, green curves, which follows the general shape of the blue curve. Interesting. Okay. Very good to know. Thank you for doing that. So amplification allows you to amplify the audio overall. Next thing I like to do um, is uh, a mixture of compression and normalization. So what normalization does is it adjusts the volume or the peaks in the audio. Um, it adjusts it according to the max peak, if that makes sense. Um, so usually what I'll do is I'll um, effect if you do normalize here um, you can normalize to a max amplitude and I hit OK and usually what that'll do is it'll adjust it and it'll just it tries to even it out a little bit um, I've heard some people say normalization isn't really that great you have to play with those a little bit to see how it works and affects your audio some people are more fans of compression versus normalization what compression does and I'll try my best way to explain this. Compression evens out the volume um, by reducing the range of the audio between the highest and the lowest peaks. So you'll notice if I zoom in on here, um, we have some high peaks and some low peaks. And the difference between that's called the dynamic range. And so what compression does is it, it uh, adjusts the volume by reducing that to make it more even so that you're not talking really loud and really soft. It tries to adjust that. Um, in the audio. So if I go to effect and compression, um, this shows the compression thing. And again, there's a lot of things that are intimidating here. Usually what I focus on is the threshold here. And uh, and I usually, I, I've taken time to just play around with this and see how it affects the audio. One of the nice things you have is the option to preview here. And what I found to be really good is to uh, keep it between 20, negative 20, and negative 10. Um, and again, you have to play with these to figure it out exactly what that's going to do. Of course, I could go through and define all of these for you, but uh, unless you know what decibels are and then hertz are and all that stuff, it can become really confusing. So usually what you do is you do that, and it'll um, it'll try to even out that audio to make it a little bit more consistent. Again, though, require your need to do this, you can see how much it's I've spiked it just in playing with it. Some of this might not be good with what I've done, but... Um, you know, if you record really, really consistent audio in a consistent room, you're maintaining consistent distance and a consistent tone, the less that you actually have to spend time time doing this. There has been times where all I needed to do was remove the background noise and do a little bit of amplification overall, and I'll, you know that's been pretty good for me. It's personal preference and playing around with it. You know, it, how you uh, how you normalize and compress or remove audio, depending on the person's voice, it can affect it. Um, and so one of the things that I always tell people is when you're editing audio, I edit with my headphones on, and um, I do it until I feel like it sounds really good. That's what I do. I edit my audio until I feel like it sounds good. And sometimes I have to play around with it more than others. Um, but I edit my audio until I feel like it sounds good good to me. And if I feel like it sounds good and it sounds good to someone else, I'm happy with that audio. Um, and it's always going to be a little different every time. The last thing I'll tell you that I like to do um, under that equalization, and I do this to my entire track, um, and I forgot where I read this, but I read that it's it's proven, it's scientifically proven, that if you add a little bit more bass to the audio, t people tend to like audio that has more bass. So one of the things that I'll sometimes do is I'll select my entire track and again, if you have a really, if somebody has a really low voice already, you may not want to do this. You might actually want to reduce the bass if somebody has a low voice. But if you want to, you know, bring up your bass a little bit, you can do this. Just add a nice curve to it. Um, and again, everything in moderation. You don't want to do it so much that, you know, it it sounds distorted. But sometimes you can go in here and add a little bit more bass to the audio just to give it a little bit more of a richer feel. And Steve brings up a great point. Sometimes clients have specific audio specifications. That's a great point. That's going to be more likely for you if you're recording um, for for a client, unless you're recording internally. Um, Steve, no, I, I, I've never used the high pass or low pass filters. That's not something I've had a chance to go in and research and play with. Um, if you have any comments on that, by all means, you know, throw that into chat. Let me find that here. 
Is that under the effects drop down? I'm having a hard time seeing. Oh, down here. The high pass and low pass filters. See if you're able to provide a quick definition of what those do. Got it. So they cut off the audio. Okay. So it sounds like you can select. Um, um, well, let me ask you this, Steve. Does it clip the audio? Can that cause clipping in your audio? Or does it literally reduce it? Does not clip it? Doesn't clip. Okay. So one of the things I was asking, and I, I can define clipping for everyone. Um, so this sounds like it, it can it can you can adjust the the overall the high pass and low pass of the audio. Um, and what I was asking about clipping is, um, and I don't know if I have an example of it here, but sometimes with audio you can see here the spike went above this 0.5 decibels, and this is actually clipped. Um, you can see where the audio is actually clipped out by Audacity. So it doesn't sound like it does that, which clipping can be a bad thing. So Steve, you said I set high pass as 100 hertz. To remove rumble. I don't know if this is good audio to do that, but let's see what happens. So 1.0, or let me, if I type in 100, I don't know if that is 1.0. So it clips it a little bit. No, it doesn't cut the word off. Um, I have a hard time, I guess, describing it without without you being able to hear. It doesn't cut the word off. It, um, mm. If you get into clipping, it can... Yeah, it, it doesn't lower the volume. It's hard. I have a hard time describing what clipping does. If anyone else has more... Yeah, you get distortion at that point when it gets too high. And that's why you want to do some of the compression and normalization um, and adjust how hot your microphone is so that you're not recording too high so that you're not going above that threshold where your frequencies are getting into the red. Yeah, I can do that. If I go to edit, um, where did I see it here? Or is it under view? Show clipping. You can see here where this red line is. That's where it's actually where it's done the clipping. Now, I haven't done a lot of editing with removing clipping. I don't know if that high pass or low pass filter, what, what Steve was pointing out, can affect that. The way that I've avoid the clipping is by adjusting the, the, the volume of my microphone before I even go into recording. You can see where these red lines are. It shows where the audio has been clipped by Audacity. And I'd be curious to know, I'll do that high pass filter. I don't know if that'll fix it at all, but it doesn't look like it does. I, you can probably do a little bit with the amplification to bring that down back to zero here. Yeah, you can bring it down a little bit so it's not clipping. But you want to be careful with that because you don't want your, you know, you can do a little bit of amplification, but you don't want your, your audio, you know, saying, in this course, you will learn how to, you know, you can <laughs> accidentally create some, some bad results there. So that's why I do that normalization and compression to, to help fix that so it does it overall. All right, we have about five minutes left, so um, obviously I'll stick around for any questions or comments for what we've covered, but that was just an overview of some of the things that I do in Audacity to help my audio sound better. Um, like I hey, did you like that video? Make sure to check out some of our other great content at elearningandcover.com.